All right, so today we're going to focus on standardized recipes. What is a standardized recipe? Yes, sir. The recipe that produces a similar amount of like we have a, a recipe that produces a certain amount of quantity. Okay. Yeah, so it's the recipe that produces the same amount of product every single time. Okay. So what is what is the benefit of having a standardized recipe? Consistency. Good. Consistency. What else? Price points. Say it again. Price points have a better idea. All right. So remember how we use our triangle to determine what we're going to sell our menu price for? Well, that cost comes from a standardized recipe. So what we're selling it for is based on the cost of that standardized recipe. We need to make sure that we are consistent, that we're always giving the same amount of um, servings. Okay. Um, are there any disadvantages to a standardized recipe? If you don't have a particular ingredient, you might be trying to substitute it. Okay, so you want to make sure you understand what uh, the appropriate substitutions are. So we might need to change a little bit. What else? Semi-variable cost. So it's, yeah, it's a semi-variable cost in the sense that, that the, the cost of food is going to fluctuate. Can we always update our menu if the prices of tomatoes goes up? Can we automatically just today up, um, substitute the price of our menu for, oh, today our tacos are $3 because our tomatoes went up. And tomorrow, tomatoes are back down, so tacos are going to be $2. Are we going to fluctuate our menu prices like that? No. Probably not. Okay, um, and so there might be some disadvantages. You might get stuck with a certain menu price, okay? If that's the case and you see a trend of those ingredients increasing, well, in that case, you want to update your menu pricing, okay? Um, another disadvantage is it takes time. Depending on how the uh, complex the recipe is, it takes some time, okay? But it's important that we take the time that we can actually identify what the cost is for our recipe items, okay? Um, one of the benefits of a standardized recipe is it tells us what our product specifications are, okay? Our product specifications. They can be usually quantity and quantity, okay? So what is the example of a quality specification about a product? Let's substitute the word product for ingredient. Okay, what's a quality specification about an ingredient that we would use in a recipe? Greg. Okay, so Atlantic salmon. Is it wild caught salmon or is it farm salmon, right? Those are quality specifications about that salmon. What else? Yes, Michael. Okay, so is it organic or not? Good. Uh, Julissa. Good. So is it fresh squeezed lime juice or is it fresh squeeze or is it lime juice that comes in a bottle? Okay. Um, you know, you see these fresh squeezed lemonade. Is somebody really back there squeezing those lemons? No. So then they changed it from fresh squeezed lemonade to home style lemonade. Right. So it's home style. It tastes like you did it at home. Okay. But it literally is like country time lemonade. They're back there pouring powder into the water and making the mix. If I call it fresh squeezed lemonade, it better be fresh squeezed lemonade, right? Because typically, if I'm if I'm selling fresh squeezed lemonade, that means I'm usually probably asking a higher price for it. Um, but if I'm just using powder mix and calling it fresh squeezed, um, that's there's a whole issue there. Now that's a kind of a a minor issue compared to like let's say you're selling Maine lobster and it's not lobster from Maine, okay? or you're selling champagne and it does not come from Champagne, France. Okay, so there are different issues, and, um, but uh, we want to make sure that those product specifications are set in that standardized recipe. This is also an opportunity where we can substitute. We can list acceptable substitutes. So if we don't have green bell peppers, but we have red bell peppers, can we put those in our fajitas? Yeah, we could. If we're doing a roasted red bell pepper sauce, can we substitute green bell peppers? 
No, we can't. Okay, and so those product specifications also list which are appropriate substitutions. Okay, so we are going to cost out some standardized recipes. Okay, these are just a couple of points that I want you to um, write down and be aware of. So one is volume and weight are not always equal. Okay, volume and weight. So volume is measured in liquid. Is liquid, right? And so the one true volume and weight match is what? What liquid? Water. Okay, 16 ounces of water weighs exactly one pound. Okay, but 16 ounces of corn syrup does not weigh one pound. It probably weighs more than one pound. Okay, so volume and weight are not always equal. So that's one thing we have to remember. The other thing is the cost per unit, that's what we pay for it, must match the recipe unit, how we're going to use it, okay? So for example, let's use flour as an example. How do we buy flour? We buy it by the what? Pound. By the pound, okay? Oftentimes, do we always use flour by the pound? No. Let's say we're making a roux. How do we use, how do we measure flour? By weight, by the ounces, right? And so if I'm buying flour by the pound and my roux calls for flour by the ounce, well then I need to convert everything from the pound to ounces to where my cost per unit matches my recipe unit, okay? And so I want everybody to write this right here, cost per unit. We've talked about it already. This cost per unit, where that per is the division line. Okay? Cost per unit. And then we have the as purchased unit and draw an arrow to the recipe unit. Okay, so write these two things down. All right, let's do a quick example. So this kind of sets this, helps us make this a little bit more, make, make a little bit more sense, okay? All right, so let's use flour as our example, okay? Our as purchased unit, let's say we purchase flour at 50 pounds. 50 pounds of flour, okay? Our recipe unit is four ounces. So point number two right here, our cost per unit and our recipe unit must match. Do our units match right now? No. Nope. They do not. We're going from pounds to ounces, okay? And so what we need to do is we need to figure out how do we get down to that cost per ounce, okay? How do we get down to that cost per ounce? Um, all right, so flour is $21 per 50 pounds. So how would I write that? I would write $21 divided by 50 pounds. Okay. $21 divided by 50 pounds. What do we get? 42, 42 cents. Okay, so 42 cents per pound. This is where putting your units is going to be key to kind of keep yourself together. So 42 cents per pound. Do my units match yet? No, I have pounds and I'm going to ounces. So how do I convert pounds to ounces? Divided by 16. I divide by 16. Why do I divide by 16? Because there's 16 ounces in a pound. Good, I'm glad we all know this. 16 ounces in a pound. So now we divide by 16 ounces. 0 0.026. So 0 0.026, so three cents per ounce, okay? 
because remember we're, we're talking about dollars right now so we can go two decimal places so we're looking at zero three cents per ounce okay now do my units match nope ounces ounces do my units match yes, yes. yes. okay so now we take zero times or three cents we multiply that by four ounces and so in this case my flour cost me how much 12 cents so can you see all of this work that we just did for one ingredient can you imagine your recipe has 20 ingredients okay it takes a long time the project that you're going to do for the end of the semester I would say about 90% of it is costing out recipes. So hopefully you'll be really good at this by the time the end of the semester. <laughs> if you're not, there's at least two more classes that you're gonna get extra practice in, international and shirt and tie, RSTO 2405. If you're in baking, you're gonna get plenty of practice with this because you have to cost out your recipes, okay? So that's how we get. So of course, remember, we buy 50 pounds of flour. I don't use it all at once. So when I make that roux, this is when that 12 cents goes into my food cost. The other part of that 50 pound flour, I haven't used it yet. So it's not part of my food cost. We talked about that last class, okay? Everyone has this sheet, correct? Yes. Who does not have this sheet? Anybody else not have a sheet that's up here on the board? Okay, so I want you to keep the, keep this. This is going to help you throughout the rest of the semester. Okay. Um, on this sheet of paper, I want you to write the numbers right above. Number one, number two, three, four, five, and six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right across the top. These are the steps that we're going to use to cost out a recipe. So the first one is copy the recipe as given, including the units. Why is it important to put units on? You don't know what units are. You know where we're starting, and then you know where we need to end. Okay? Okay, so the copy the units for the recipe is where we're gonna end. And then the units for when we purchase it is where we're going to start. So number two is fill in the ingredients in the same order as the recipe. Why is it important to go in the same order? Okay, so yeah, this is how we make it. These are the order of the ingredients we're going to use it when we're actually producing the recipe. But in this case, as we're, as we're costing things out, why is it important to go in the exact same order? So we don't miss something. So we keep it uniform. That way you make sure that you're looking at your original recipe, you write it down in exactly the same order. Number three, we fill in the as purchase costs and units. Okay, so we fill in the as purchase costs. What is as purchase cost? What you pay for it. That's what we paid for it. When that 50 pound bag of flour came off the truck, we paid $21 for it. That is the as purchase cost. Okay, <clears throat> this next step, number four, is really important. We want to break down the as purchase price to the cost of one recipe unit. Okay, so that's the order. That's where we did the arrow from as purchase to recipe unit. You want to copy it down or you want to convert it down to one recipe unit. That way we can simply multiply. Okay, we can simply multiply the cost for one unit times the amount that we need. And the last step is to add up all the totals. Okay. So now pull out the next sheet of paper, which has a standardized recipe, the two slides, this one right here, has the two slides on it, okay? <coughs> Bless you. All right, so this is the top slide that you have. What step from this slide here, what step is this? Step number one. We copied it as given. 
So step number one, I want you to write a number one right here and circle it. Yes, sir. You don't have that one? Okay. So step one, we're copying it as written. Before we move on, let's look and talk about what we've got here on our standardized recipe. Okay. First, and very important, is the name of what we're making. Okay. The name of what we're making. What are we making today? Pasta sauce. The yield. What is yield? What you're, what you're getting out of it. How much it makes. Okay. How much it makes. So what, do we, what is our yield here? Three quarts. It also tells us our portions. So this is how many portions we should expect to get out of this recipe. We should be able to, when we make this pasta sauce recipe, we should be able to serve 24 servings. Why is that important? For our costs. We know how much, we're selling this pasta for a certain amount, so we want to make sure we're covering all of that cost, okay? And then four ounces is our portion size, okay? Why is that important to know what our portion size is? So we can calculate what our price per unit is, good. What else? So we don't waste it, so we know how much to serve. So if my portion size is four ounces, am I going to use an eight ounce ladle? No. no. What am I going to use? Probably a four ounce ladle or maybe a portion cup or maybe a two ounce ladle and I can do two scoops of sauce, okay? And so using the appropriate serving tools is also gonna help us with that. All right, number two, step number two. Go out of the bottom slide. Where is step number two? Where on here is step number two? Right here, step number two. Take write a number two and circle it. These are in the exact same order as the recipe. Okay. Step number three is right here. We have invoice cost and invoice unit. Invoice cost and invoice unit. All right. Step number four. The fourth all right, step number four right here. And now we're going to multiply by the amount that we need. That's what we call our extended cost, okay? That's what we call our extended cost. Now, technically on this page, this looks a little bit different than the one that I have, which I'll give to y'all um, when you get ready for the project. This one doesn't really show necessarily the work based on what... Um, Actually, no, it does. Yeah, 33 cents per pound. There we go. That's how much we need. Just kidding. Four, number five. One, two, three, four, five. And step number six is where? At the bottom. That's our subtotal. Okay. So now, I know the recipe is here, but let's look at olive oil. Let's look at olive oil. Are our recipes, or sorry, are our units the same for olive oil? No. What do I need? What do I need for the recipe? What's my unit for the recipe? One pint. What's my rest? What's my as purchased unit? Four gallons. Get four gallons. Good. Okay. So now let's do. Um, let's break this down. I know the answer is already given, but that's okay. Let's go ahead and work this one out. So what do we start with? Four gallons, right? And what is our cost for those four gallons? $112. So somewhere on your paper, I want you to write $112 divided by four gallons. Equals. How much? $28 per gallon? Again, this is where your units is going to 
come into play. We need to make sure we're always writing those units on there. So do our units match yet? No. Okay, so what do we need to do? Divide by what? There's eight pints in the gallon. Okay, is there eight pints in a gallon? Is there four pints in a gallon? Is it 16 pints in a gallon? How many uh, pints in a gallon? Oh my gosh, I don't know. Okay. So this is where your memorization that you did in Chef 13, 1301 comes into play. You need to know how many pints are in a gallon. It is eight, eight pints per gallon. Okay. Wait, is it eight pints? Yes. 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 Okay, eight pints. That's right, because there's four quarts in a gallon. There's two pints. Okay, so now we do 28 divided by eight. $3.50 per pint. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. yeah, check it out. Our recipe cost is three fifty per pint. <laughs> Okay, how much do we need? We need one pint. That's a really easy multiplication. 350 times one is 350, okay? That means our, our olive oil costs $3.50 for that, okay? Now you'll notice that we have the olive oil, the onions, the celery, and the tomatoes, um, and then the fresh garlic cloves um, cost it out, right? Everything else below that, salt, pepper, sugar, oregano, basil, parsley. The textbook here actually just gives you 10 cents for each one. Most often, if you actually cost out salt, you're going to get less than a penny. Okay? If you cost out pepper, unless it's like an exorbitant amount, you're going to get less than a penny, or you're going to get less than five cents. Right? And so if it's ever less than a penny, just charge a penny for it. The textbook here just does 10 cents to cover all of those ingredients, okay? So that means then number six is we add up everything at the bottom, $7.88, to make this um, pasta sauce. And now what we want to do is we want to figure out what that cost per portion is. So how do we do cost per portion? Okay, so cost per portion, that's probably an awful, that's definitely an awful color for me to use up there. There we go, cost per portion. What was our total cost? $7.88, and we divide that by, we have 24 servings. Okay. And that gives us 33 cents per portion. What are they making? Oh, just the sauce. Just the sauce. So that 33 cents per portion is just the sauce. Now if we're serving it with pasta, we're serving it with Parmesan cheese, we're serving it with a chicken breast, all of those ingredients come together to make that total recipe, okay? I might use this pasta sauce in a variety of different recipes. I might use it in my chicken parmesan, I might use it in my spaghetti, I might use it in my lasagna. So you can see having a standardized recipe for pasta sauce, now I can just go in and it costs me 33 cents for four ounces. I can actually go in and just um, plug that number into all the recipes where I'm gonna need this pasta sauce, okay? Questions, comments, concerns about this? We're gonna get lots of practice. Okay, we're going to get lots and lots of practice with it. So our portion size. Our portion size can come in weight, volume, or count. We talked about this a little bit. We touched on it a little bit as far as why it's important to have portion control. Our spaghetti sauce, for example, we need 24 servings out of that. So if I'm expecting to serve 48 servings of spaghetti, I'm going to double my recipe. Well, what happens if my line cook is like not paying attention and they're like, oh, this doesn't look like enough sauce. We have a little bit more sauce. And then it comes into the, the day and I've got 48 portions of spaghetti. 
and I'm missing sauce for two extra portions. So now I can't serve these two extra portions of spaghetti. They don't have any more sauce because somebody was not careful in what they were doing. Okay? So that's why portion cost or portion size is so important. Who what's, what's an example of portion size as a weight? Okay, so a 16 ounce ribeye. That ribeye is a 16 ounce steak. Okay, that's by weight. What else? So you said salad, Damien. Yeah, so if it's four ounces of salad greens, then that is by weight. That's my recipe, my portion control. What else? Okay, so it might be like by a pound of rice. It might be like anything that you measure by weight, that's going to be your portion cost. Volume is primarily liquids. Okay, so if it's an eight ounce cup of orange juice, or if it is a 16 ounce, if it's a pint of beer, it needs to be 16 ounces, okay? What else? Volume. Besides, that's the, what's a liquid that's not a beverage? Oil stock. Sure. So stock or what do you use stock in? Soups. So a bowl of soup versus a cup of soup. There's a volume difference there, okay? It's not much, usually. <laughs> that's why it's always good to sell a bowl of soup instead of a cup of soup, right? Because we like almost double the price for a bowl of soup. And it's not that much more of the of the actual product. Um, okay, so volume is by, uh, is typically liquids. Count, what's an example? Um, hold on, Jasmine, what's an example of a count for portion control? Think about a plate that you've eaten where there's like a specific number of something on that plate. Sure. Okay, so chicken what? Chicken strips. So you so you think about it, right? You chicken strips. When you go to KFC, you can get a three strip, a five strip, or a nine strip. I usually go for the twelve strip because I want to have a little bit of leftovers. Okay, that's by count. There better be twelve strips in my box. <laughs> Okay, um, shrimp, there might, if you're selling like, let's say a shrimp Alfredo, there needs to be at least a certain number of shrimp in that, okay? Not more, not less. Um, Oyster. Wings, good. Oysters, uh, good. If I'm selling by the, by the dozen, then, you're, then you're, there needs to be 12 oysters in that um, presentation. Wings. Okay, so all these are by count. It's important for us. Now, sometimes if the wings are really small, we might throw extra ring wings in there, right? To help the guests and the customer feel like they're getting what they paid for. If they're smaller than normal, we might do that, okay? Um, trying to think. Okay, so portion, volume, weight, and count. Not totally weight, maybe weight in this example. So yesterday I went to Whiskey Cake for brunch with some friends. Mm. I got the I have a Bloody Mary bar. I love Bloody Mary bars. They are awesome. And so basically what they do is they sell you a setup. So they give me a glass with ice and a little shot of vodka in the bottom. And then I go to the Bloody Mary bar and I can make whatever kind of Bloody Mary I want to. There's um, two different types. There's uh, like a house made mix and like a, like a standard tomato juice mix. And then they have like all of these toppings, bacon, sausage, carrot, celery, all this stuff, right? It's $9 for a Bloody Mary. I think I put $9 of the bacon in my cup, right? I'm like, there's no such thing as too much bacon in a Bloody Mary. And then sausage, I came back, I should have taken a picture. I came back and like, there was like this, I basically did, probably didn't need to order any food because my <laughs> garnish was like filling enough. Um, they had pickled onions and they had blue, blue cheese stuffed olives, right? And so you think about it and you're like, how do you cost that out? Is $9 really a good, a good amount for this? Um, and so you think about, well, how much did that shot of vodka cost? And if somebody put like one of everything on here, what would that actually cost? Okay. Um, so there's a way to kind of calculate that. But at the same time, if they're buying a Bloody Mary, they're also probably eating. 
and breakfast food is not typically too terribly expensive, okay? And so you can charge the food, the, the markup on the food also can kind of cover that as well, okay? Um, also, not every single person orders a Bloody Mary. Some people might drink a mimosa, which is just orange juice and champagne or sparkling wine, right? And so, again, there's ways to do that. But if you are actually in the kitchen making all these recipes, you want to follow what actual standardized recipe, the portion size that it says, okay? All right, A, P, and E, P. As purchased versus edible portion. Do we always serve exactly what we buy? No. no. What's an example of that? Brisket. Brisket is the perfect example of that. Okay, we have a loss. We have to trim the brisket. We have to cook the brisket. Okay, typically brisket has about between a 45 to 50 percent edible portion, meaning we're going to lose almost half of our product in the cooking process, in the preparation and cooking process. Okay. Another example here we have here is onions. We start with 11 onions, they have 11 pounds of onions. But do we actually serve the skin? No. no, but we pay for the skin, don't we? We pay for onions by the pound, by the weight. And so when we're done with it, we throw away the skins and the peels, and then we're only left with the onions that are left over. Okay. Um, when I was at Chester's Hamburgers, uh, we would uh, we would have our um, onions that we put on the um, on the burgers. And they had to be a perfect onion, like a perfect ring, okay? So I would chop the tops of my onions off, and then I'd put them in the onion slicer, and then I'd take the middle out, because nobody wants to eat the very center of an onion on their burger. So I'd take the middle out, and any pieces that broke off that were not like a perfect onion ring, um, and i put them in an own little container. Do I throw them away? No, we don't. So what we did with those is we just chopped them up, poured some butter on them and made them to grilled onions. They charge, I think like 60 cents for grilled onions. That's 60 cents for something I would have just thrown away. Okay. Um, Chef Costello did a, an in-service and he did a training with um, some elementary school cafeteria uh, workers. And um, they, he, they're basically teaching them knife skills and teaching them like kind of like a very condensed uh, basic skills class, right? And so he hands everybody two crowns of broccoli. So two, I guess, stalks of broccoli. And the one lady chops the, the stalk off and throws it away. And he saw her do that twice. And he was like, what are you doing? And she's like, well, that's what we do in the, in the kitchen. We're, we're not going to use that part. We just use the broccoli florets, just the crown of the head. And he was just like, okay, this wasn't on the lesson, but let me show you. Okay. And so he took a moment to stop and show them how to make a broccoli cheese soup using those extra stock ends of the broccoli that you normally would throw away. And so utilizing that cost, we've paid for it. So why not use it in a recipe? And the kids love broccoli cheese soup. I mean, you put cheese on anything um, more than often, but they're gonna eat it, okay? Um, and so let's talk about as purchased versus our edible portion. In this case right here, we've done a cook loss test because every single um, brisket is not going to give you the same amount of yield. Okay, every single onion is not going to give you the same amount of yield. Every single ingredient is not going to be identical every single time. Okay, and so in this case, what they did is they did a five times um, trial, a cook loss test. You all did that in Chef 13, 1301, right? You took the whole brisket, you trimmed it. How many of you have not taken 1301? Basic skills class. I'm taking it. You're taking it now? Okay, so in this semester, you will do this, okay? Um, you're gonna take a whole brisket, you're gonna trim all the fat off. So you can see the raw, the cooked weight, the trimming that we actually cut off of there, um, what is actually usable. So we start with 9.4 pounds, but we can actually only use 5.1 pounds of that. And so if our first brisket yielded a 52 or 54.2%. So we did that five times. 
we added all those up together, we get an average of 50%, okay? So that means that sometimes we're gonna get a little bit more, sometimes we're gonna get a little bit less. You can get that average. This is what we can use in order to um, predict what w the amount of product that we're going to need. There's this wonderful, wonderful math problem called brisket math. I don't know if any of you ever heard of it before, any of the horror stories of your classmates that have taken this class before. But brisket math is something that we're going to do multiple times as well um, to understand how much product we actually need to order. Okay. Um, so before we go talk about updating recipe card um, costs, I want to go over our edible portion and our as purchase yield. Okay. Edible portion and our as purchase yield. Guess what we have? A triangle, because our yield is what? Percent. It's a percentage. So where does percent go? Okay. What is the universal formula for percent? Part over the whole. Good job, Anissa. Okay. Part over the whole. I heard her like I saw her like mouth the word. She didn't want to say it out loud. Um, so in this case, what is our part? Well, let's go back. What's our whole? What we start with, which is our as purchased. Goes from the bottom. So what's our part? The edible portion. Okay. Edible portion is our part. The multiplication and the division are the same. Multiplication and division are the same. Okay. How are we doing on time? It's nine, nine o'clock. Nine okay. So let's use that example we saw before about onions. Okay. So with our onions, our as purchased, they purchased 11 pounds. Eleven pound. That looks really awful. Hold on. <laughs> Let's try this again. Okay. And our edible portion was what? Ten pounds. So now, what are we looking for? Our percent yield. So how do we calculate that? What do we do? Remember, we cover up the percent yield. And what's left over? EP over AP. So 10 pounds divided by 11 pounds. Point nine one. So that is, translates to 91, oops, what did I do that for? 91%. We have a 91% usage, okay? 91% edible portion. So how do we use that 91%? Yay, good job, we got 91%, we got the answer, okay? But how do we apply that? Do we always buy onions by 11 pounds? No. We don't always buy onions by 11 pounds. We might buy a 50 pound bag of onions. So now, if I know my percentage is 91, and my as purchased is now 50 pounds, and I'm looking for my edible portion, now what do I do? No, I'm looking for my EP. So I cover my EP and what's left over? 50 pounds times 0.91. 50 pounds times 0.91. What's that? So 45.5 pounds. Is 
So in that formula, we're not um, converting the 91. 0.91 to the percent, right? Well, 91%, I, divided, I put it back to okay. 0.91, yep. And that one, I put it back to 0.91. See how that works? Is this, is this just a problem you came up with yourself? Yep. Okay. Well, we started, with the, we started with the slide before of the onions. Oh, okay. Okay, oh, so okay. now this is what I'm just coming up with. A 50-pound bag of onions, yep. Okay, 50-pound bag of onions. Let's do it one more way. Okay, let's do it one more way. Let's say I'm making French onion soup. It's one of my favorite soups. Love it. I'm making French onion soup, and now I need 100 pounds of onions. That's a lot of onions. That's a lot of French onion soup. That's okay. Okay, I need 100 pounds of onions. That is what? Is that my edible portion or my as purchased? As purchased. That's my edible. I need 100 pounds to make my recipe, okay? I need 100 pounds. Does that mean I'm going to order 100 pounds? No. If I order 100 pounds, am I going to end up with 100 pounds? No. No. And so now I need 100 pounds for my recipe. That's my edible portion. What is my percentage? 91%, so 0.91. Now what's 100 divided by 0.91? I'm going to make sure I order at least 110 pounds of onions so that when I'm all done, I can actually have 100 pounds of onions for my recipe. Okay, so that's why it's important for us to do this edible portion, this edible yield, and as purchased, okay? In the brisket math, it's going to be even more clear because this has a relatively high percentage. If it has a lower percentage, then the error, if you make a mistake and you don't order enough food, you're going to be out a lot of servings, okay? Selena, you have to put your question. Um, it not always. Um, there is a, 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 a it's called the book of yields. And so again, you know, you remember that slide we talked about how we did five cook loss tests for five different briskets and got an average. So this would be like an average. Okay. So you can figure out what the average is and then just use it as a guideline because it's not going to be too far off that. Now, unless you have someone who's not trained in how to cut an onion and they chop off an inch and a half to top, chop off just the top portion of it. They chop off an inch and a half of it. That's a big old chunk of onion. And so if you realize that you're running out of onions, you're running out of product relatively quickly, you might go back to, as a manager, you might go back to the production stage and you might watch, see who, who made these, who sliced these onions. I'm going through onions like crazy. And you watch Johnny, there's no Johns in here, right? Okay, I don't want to blame anybody. Any mistakes on anybody in here? You go back and you watch Johnny, and you're just like, hey, Johnny, you you need to like slice off the tip of the onion, okay? You just not like just chop it off randomly. Um, with potatoes, when I was at Chester's again at Chester's Hamburgers, one of my responsibilities for the opening kitchen job was to cut the potatoes for the day, and so I had to inspect every single potato as I'm scrubbing it. And if there's a bad spot, I had to take the paring knife and, and chop that bad spot off. If I'm going crazy and chopping off big old giant chunks when I could literally just take out the little bad piece, I'm going to waste all that extra product, right? And so you also want to make sure, oh my gosh, we're go you went through, you did 200 pounds of potatoes and you only came up with seven, like 175 pounds. Where did the extra 25 pounds go? You want to look at the, at the different process, okay? Question. Yes. Is 110 pounds what it's going to take to make the onion, French onion soup? Or I need to order 110. To have so after plate. I'm done peeling and chopping all of those onion skins, mm -hmm. I'm going to have 100 pounds for my recipe. Okay? All right. So.
get all this out of the way. We need to update our car, our recipes some uh, sometimes. Okay, so we not, might need to update our recipes because the cost of an ingredient goes up. We might have to update our recipe because so many people are asking for extra salad dressing on the side. Right? Our recipe for our salad includes two ounces of salad dressing. Well, if people keep asking for extra dressing on the side, what's that doing to my cost? It's going up. Am I getting money for that cost? No. I'm not. Okay? And so what you might do is increase to three ounces of dressing. So include rather than two ounces of dressing, include three ounces of dressing as your recipe cost. But if your standard is still two ounces, then every time you sell something that's just to two ounces, you're getting a little extra cost, a little extra money to cover those times when people are asking for extra sauce. Okay? Does that make sense? So not every single person is going to ask for extra dressing, but by doing that um, one ounce extra, you're adding that cost into the, the cost of your salad, but at the same time, as somebody does come, so let's say, um, I'm trying to learn names still. Jackie. Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Jackie and Damien and uh, Frank and I walk into a restaurant, Okay. And I just get the regular amount of sauce or the dressing. And Jackie wants extra ranch dressing. And Damien, Dejan, sorry, Damien's right there. Dejan, um, Dejan wants the regular amount of dressing. And Frank just wants lemon juice because he doesn't want any dressing because he doesn't like dressing. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's go with that. So now I've charged for three ounces of dressing for each time. But for me, I'm only serving two ounces. For Jackie, I'm serving four ounces. Dejan, I'm only serving two ounces. And Frank, I'm not serving any dressing. So that basically covers those three ounces, right? Covers Jackie's two extra two extra ounces that she's asked for. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect example, again, last night I went to Maggiano's for dinner with a group of friends. And I love their rigatoni D, but there's never enough sauce for me. So I asked for extra sauce on the side. I'm that person sometimes, okay? It's like a Marsala cream sauce, and it is like the best. Oh my gosh, it's so good. So I was like, I want extra sauce on the side. So my original recipe did not account for that extra cost. Now, as a restaurateur, if I know that that spaghetti sauce cost me 33 cents that we went over before, I can calculate. If somebody wants an extra four-ounce serving of spaghetti sauce, I can charge them for that spaghetti sauce, right? Because I know that it cost me 33 cents and I can actually say, okay, that's actually gonna be $2. If you want the spaghetti sauce extra on the side, that's $2 for the sauce. I'm covering my costs there, okay? Things like salad dressing, you could identify as 50 cents extra for extra, extra salad dressing. You could do that, okay? Um, any other questions, comments, concerns about that? So like for the most part, do restaurants, because um, I've worked at places where they're like, you have to put in every single sauce. We're not charging them for it, but we have to account for it. And I've had places where they don't, they're just like, okay, you know, give it to them. Is does keeping track of the amount of, of extra sauce we're handing out help them go back and reevaluate that price? Come Absolutely. That you time? can go in that, you can go back and look and say, okay, we served 35 salads today and 30 of them wanted extra sauce. I might need to go back and update the, the, the price of my salads because if my if I'm always giving away this extra sauce, then I then it's, it's going to cost me, right? So it's more mm -hmm. kind of like for inventory purposes. Yeah, absolutely. We could also do, we could have a recipe that's just for spaghetti. How many of you have ever seen that on a rest, on a menu where it's like, you know, this is a spaghetti or a fettuccine Alfredo, and then add chicken, $3, add shrimp, $4, add whatever. You know, you can add things to it. So is it really cost $3 to add a chicken breast to that chicken fettuccine Alfredo? No, it does not. Okay? It maybe costs less than 50 cents, probably, depending on how much uh, chicken is being served. Okay? 
but we're charging three dollars for it so that's where we can start we can get with our servers and start upselling did you want to add ch um, chicken to your pasta do you want to add chicken to your caesar salad do you want to do that right that helps us increase our sales um at not very much of a cost uh, okay and is that also part of like what you were saying like there's people that don't add right you know dressing so it's kind of helping offset well in that case the fettuccine alfredo is one cost and then adding the chicken is three dollars adding so rather than just say chicken fettuccine alfredo with chicken is $8.99 and fettuccine alfredo is $15.99 and the shrimp is $19.99. Rather than having those three different prices, it kind of consolidates your menu that the fettuccine alfredo is $15.99. If you want chicken, it's $3. If you want shrimp, it's $4. So it just helps consolidate your menu just a little bit, keeps it a little bit cleaner, okay? Um, recipe card, you could use recipe card software. Something else that's really easy to do, if you know how to do it, you have to pay for a, ma a major software program is developing a formula in Excel. You can create, remember this sheet that we saw right here on the second slide? You can create this in Excel. I just had a light bulb go on. I might create an Excel assignment for y'all to do this. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. <laughs> mm. Turn it yes. off. <laughs> yes okay if I if I think about how I'm gonna do that then then yes I will do that because it is so important Excel is is so crucial okay um, one of my goals for next semester I might start doing it this semester building it up one of my goals for next semester is to have an Excel assignment in every single class that I teach okay of some sort it's important to know how to use Excel um, it can save you a lot of money if you don't have to buy all these additional softwares to create a recipe, if you can do it in Excel, it saves you a lot of money, okay? Especially if you're an independently owned business. If you're a big corporation, their business probably already has this software available, okay? Um, and so when you're, in, when you're working in Excel, if the price of the tomatoes go up, well, guess what? I just go into my recipes and I update the price of tomatoes and boom my recipe is done and recalculated, okay? Excel has many wonderful purposes. All right, plate costs. What time do we have? 14, this class is done at 25, right? Oh, there's my 10 minute warning. Okay, I'm, let's go through, um, you all have this page, right? It has multiple choice answers on it. Nope, I give you two of the same. Sorry, Teresa. All right, everyone has this page with the multiple choice answers on it. So right now what we're looking for is the standard portion cost. So all of these ingredients make up one plate. So first sentence. Mike's place serves breakfast plates with how many eggs? Two, two eggs. Two eggs. Okay, so this is our plate, our whole plate consists of two eggs. What else? Hash browns. What else? Toast. How many pieces of toast? Two toast. And then two bacon or sausage. Okay. This is our breakfast plate. It's a pretty standard breakfast plate. Eggs, hash brown, toast, bacon or sausage. Okay. Now, let's look at number one. What question am I asking? Standard portion cost of eggs for a breakfast plate. What is my standard portion for eggs? Two eggs. Two eggs. Okay. Looking up here, it says, how much do eggs cost? $38 for a dozen. $38 for, $38 for 30 dozen. So I want you to write right next to, right inside this area where we have a blank space. I want you to write this. Oops. 30 dozen 
and then draw your arrow and we're going to how many what's our portion cost our portion size two, two eggs 30 dozen to two eggs everybody look at your neighbor's paper does, does their paper have this arrow with 30 dozen and two eggs give me a thumbs up if yes thumbs down if no call your neighbors out they need to be on top of things okay 30 dozen two eggs now do I my units match no they do not match okay 30 dozen to two eggs they do not match so what do I need to do divide 38 dollars 38 dollars by 30 dozen that gives me my cost per dozen $38 gives me a dollar and 27 cents per dozen. Do my units match yet? No, they do not. So now I do a dollar and 27 cents per dozen. Divide by 12 eggs in a dozen. And I get four cents per egg, correct? Yes or no? No. I got point 10, point 11. I don't think that's an answer choice either. Oh, just kidding. I, feel I must, I might, well, four cents is what my calculator gave me, so just like I told y'all before, the calculator is always correct. doesn't give you the right answer, but the calculator is always correct. So that's 11 cents per egg, right? You could do 10.5 cents per egg because we're going to use two eggs, okay? Or you can do 11, 11 cents per egg. Now, if it's multiple choice, of course you're going to have one of those one of those answers. If you're just calculating this, you can do it as 10.5 cents per egg, um, uh, with the understanding that you're not always going to use just one egg, okay? Or you can round it up to 11 cents, and you're always going to get that a little bit cost covered, okay? Whatever format you do, the the format you need to stick with. So 11 cents per egg or 10.5 cents. What's my standard portion cost? 21 cents. Okay, so it's 21 cents because I have two eggs. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Do you have to do it this way every single time? Yes, yes and no. How many eggs are in 30 dozen? 360 eggs. So, could I do $38 divided by 360 eggs? Yes. I absolutely could. And that would give me my initial cost per egg. Okay, times two. So you can do it. If you need to do it step by step like this, I want you to do it that way to make sure you get the right answer. If you can do it where you can take three, there's 30 eggs, 30 dozen eggs, and there's 12 eggs per dozen, that's 360 eggs, and divide that, you can totally do that. It's up to you. I just need to see the work. Okay, if you just come to me and say, Mr. Yemisky, I'm not getting the right answer, and I come and I don't see any work, then I can't tell you what step that we're getting off, okay? So, what I would like you to do for Wednesday is I would like you to complete two through seven. Two through seven and bring it with you completed. We're going to go over the correct answers when you come into class on Wednesday, okay? Last thing before I let you go. Those of you who came in late, I have the um, assignments, the quizzes from the last couple weeks. Um, you have an opportunity to get your grade back up to a perfect score on this forecasting percentage increase or decrease. If you do not have a perfect score, you have the opportunity to bring that up to a perfect score. What do you need to do for that? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. What you must do is you need to recorrect, or you need to correct all the answers you got incorrect on your original paper. On the back of it, you need to create 20 new examples. 10 that are increasing, 10 that are decreasing. Okay? You must show all your work. 
there is the calculator that's on Canvas that I provided, so you can actually check your work to make sure your answers are correct, okay? But you, if you do not show the work, you will not get credit for it. Any questions, comments, concerns about that?